real racists are not ashamed of being racist. The whole point, though, of critical race theory is allegedly to help us to actually heal racial wounds and promote racial reconciliation. I would say, by and large, our public schools are teaching little or no education. I would suggest for all parents, we need to find alternatives of one kind or another. Uh, and this needs to happen not only at the school, but also at the college level. Dinesh D'Souza is a renowned filmmaker. He's an award-winning author and a cultural commentator. He's done highly publicized debates about politics and Christianity. He was even named one of America's most influential conservative thinkers by the New York Times Magazine. Dinesh, welcome to Takeaways. Hey, thanks for having me, Kirk. It's a pleasure to join you. You have written articles about education. You've written books about education. You've made movies that deal with education. Um, you've spent so many times speaking on college campuses and you've studied the subject of what kids are learning. Um, number one question, do you think that our kids and grandkids are being better educated or worse educated than they were a few generations ago? And are we creating better thinkers or worse thinkers with all of the information that we're providing them today? I think that we are seeing a, uh, we have seen uh, a sharp decline in the quality of education, not just from a few generations ago, but uh, even from one generation ago, which is basically when I came to America as an exchange student from India. Uh, I spent a year um, in high school, in a public school in Arizona, uh, and then I went to college in the United States, Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. And uh, now education, you know, is different at the school level than it is at the college level. I would say that at the school level, it's an introduction to ideas and a kind of answer to the sort of basic questions that young people ask about life. I mean, think about that natural curiosity that you have as a kid, where you just look around you and you say things like, well, why does a tree grow? Why is the sky blue? Uh, why does the ocean recede and then come back out? In other words, why do the tides go back and forth? Uh, why uh, are human beings different from, say, other animals? How, how is it that we can speak? Why do people in different countries use different languages? Why don't we all speak the same language? So there's a kind of natural human wonder, um, which is anchored in the desire to know. And so a good school will tap into that and will, on the basis of that, introduce young people to like all the basics. Now, when you go to college, uh, you uh, undertake something a little different, I would say. And that is the enterprise of really learning critical thinking, critical reasoning, uh, and a certain kind of healthy skepticism, a skepticism that doesn't deny truth, but recognizes that truth in some cases is kind of elusive. You don't really know how to find it. You aren't sure if it's absolute truth or just truth that is truth for now. So um, this is the mission of schools and colleges. Now, you only have to outline it to realize how little of it is actually going on today, particularly in the public schools. Young people graduate and they don't even have basic cultural literacy. Um, and then they go on to college. And the one thing that they need to learn, which is critical reasoning, uh, they usually don't learn. Uh, and this is even true in our best schools and universities. So it's not that we don't send smart kids, but smartness is not enough because um, we need to have an educated intelligence, and an educated intelligence is one in which you learn how to have arguments that go back and forth. You learn how to see even the force of an argument from the other side, an argument that you disagree with. Uh, so that if someone were to say to you, you know, you are, let's just say, for example, Kirk, you and I are believers, but if someone were to say to us, can you state the most forceful argument that you can for atheism? Education is partly enabling us to do that. Even though we think that argument can be answered, we, have, we are open-minded enough to understand why someone might hold a different position than we do. So unfortunately, all of this um, uh, is, has, which I think was at one time kind of central to what education is all about, is today pushed aside in favor of new forms of indoctrination that are going on both in the schools and in the universities. Isn't it true that, that, that the, the, the term being liberal uh, in, in a classic sense uh, meant that 
you didn't just have to stick with the old ways, that you could discuss new ways, and, and we, could, we could bring it all to the table and discuss it. But it seems now that that, 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 that has shifted now to something that's like, no, we just actually want to hate the old ways, and we want to go to these new ways, and no other ways are allowed. And then that, there comes the indoctrination. How, how did that whole shift take place? It, uh, it took place because uh, classical liberalism uh, became replaced with uh, what is now sometimes called progressivism uh, or socialism. Uh, but socialism and progressivism are very illiberal. They attack the liberal idea, even though they sometimes purport to do it in the name of liberal values. So mm. social justice, for example, is a liberal value. Um, and, um, and liberalism was concerned with having both individual justice, meaning justice between individuals, and uh, also social justice. In other words, justice for society as a whole. Uh, this is a, a, an old preoccupation of classical liberalism. In fact, if you go right back to uh, Plato's Republic, uh, here's Socrates, and he, he basically says, let me try, and I'm going to only do this in speech, I'm not going to do it in reality, in speech, meaning through ideas, let me construct a just society. What would a just society look like? And uh, so we see this concern with justice going to the very beginning of our civilization. Now, uh, you are right that the idea of liberalism is connected with the idea of openness, uh, of freedom. It comes from liberalis, the free man, as opposed to the slave. And um, you cannot have liberal education without openness of mind. Now, by and large, openness of mind means being open not only to the future. This is the progressive idea. Let's, let's always focus on the future. But uh, what about an open-mindedness toward the past? What about trying to understand the past under its own terms? So when you try to understand somebody like an Abraham Lincoln, uh, and people say, well, wait a minute, didn't Abraham Lincoln say that if he could fight the Civil War without freeing a single slave, he would do it? Yes, he did say that, but he said that at a critical time, and he said that for a particular reason. So unless you understand the reason why somebody like Lincoln would say that, uh, and in this particular case, he said that because he wanted to keep the border states, which, by the way, had slavery, but had not seceded. He wanted to keep the border states in the Union. And he realized if I frame the Civil War as an argument over slavery, all the border states which have slaves will join the Confederacy. But if I frame this as an argument over saving the Union, I will be able to keep those border states in the Union. So, again, uh, a liberal approach is an approach of trying to understand a man like Lincoln in the context of the situation facing uh, him at the time. It's not enough to say, well, you know, we in the 21st century really don't like slavery. And if we were Lincoln, we would have decided something differently. We're superimposing modern conditions uh, on people who had to make very different types of decisions because they faced very different circumstances. Mm. That's so important. That is absolutely so important. And if we don't take, if we don't help our kids and ourselves, we don't get that bigger, larger context uh, and understand these ideas from classical liberalism, uh, we just think there's only one way, and that's what we're getting from the left. Um, how seriously should we as parents and grandparents consider alternative forms of education? I mean, I went to public school as a kid, um, but we did not send our kids to public school uh, when we uh, were raising a family. Uh, how important is it today with where we're at to really start considering homeschool and private school? Well, I think that um, the um, original rationale for public schools has completely disappeared. So when public schools uh, really uh, became common in the 19th century, they had a kind of assimilation function. The idea was that people are coming to America from all over the place, uh, many of them uh, are uh, from, you know, Eastern Europe. Uh, there are Jews, there are Irish, there are Italians. Uh, and then later, of course, Koreans and West Indians and Pakistanis and so on. And the idea was that they need to be drawn into a single common culture. And the public schools, believe it or not, were set up to do that. Now, you can ask, are they doing that now? Absolutely not. Not only are they not doing it, they don't even want to do it. They actually, far from emphasizing our common culture, uh, uh, they emphasize the opposite, our differences. They emphasize, if you will, identity politics. Uh, are you black? Are you female? Are you uh, trans? Are you this? Are you that? And they try to italicize or highlight those differences. 
Mm. So I would say, by and large, our public schools are teaching little or no education. I would suggest for all parents, we need to find alternatives of one kind or another. Uh, and this needs to happen not only at the school, but also at the college level. And if we pull our kids out of uh, traditional education for a better form of education, uh, are we abandoning something that needs to be preserved? Are, are, should we be salt and light in a public school system and say, hey, that's, that's what it's all about, is, is, is influencing? Uh, or do we need to take the approach of, no, if we send our children to Caesar, they're gonna come back Romans, and so we need to uh, abandon that whole plan? I think abandonment is the right approach for this reason, that you can't be salt and light when you're kind of at the receiving end of something. So if you were to ask me, should parents try to get on school boards? Yes, they should do that. You can be salt and light that way, as long as we have public schools. And of course, some people are not in a position to do homeschooling or they can't afford private education. And, and so I'm not saying uh, there may be uh, parents who have kids in public schools and then they should do what they can to exercise parental involvement and leverage uh, over the school to make sure that the school is actually teaching what it ought to teach. I think, you know, one of the silver linings of COVID is a lot of parents, you know, they, uh, they're, they're, their children were getting indoctrinated right and left, but they didn't know about it. Mm. But when they started doing this stuff online, the parent sort of ducks into his or her kid's room and they go, wait a minute, what are they teaching, Johnny? And so the, the, the parental movement against critical race theory, against some of this ideological indoctrination was as a result of parents' eyes being opened in the wake of COVID because they finally realized what's actually going going on in their kids' classroom. D Dinesh, you had mentioned in uh, just a moment ago, critical race theory. Uh, for, for a lot of people, uh, this is starting to become a household phrase. Can you help us understand what is CRT, critical race theory? Critical race theory uh, arose out of an earlier movement that was simply called critical theory. Now, who are the champions of critical theory? By and large, these were uh, leftist or Marxist theoreticians, scholars, who were writing in the early to mid part of the 20th century. So Marx thought that basically the world is divided into two kinds of people, the working class, and these are the people who are oppressed, and the capitalist class, and those are the people who do the oppressing. And so for Marx, uh, class was kind of the, the lever uh, to drive a wedge through society, to create revolutionary resentment, and ultimately to cause a revolution itself. So critical race theory takes this whole framework on board. It embraces it. It just adds one element. It takes the idea of class and replaces it with the idea of race. The whole point, though, of critical race theory is allegedly to help us to actually heal racial wounds and promote racial reconciliation. Is, is, is it gonna do that? Absolutely not. And I think that if you probe the critical race theory guys, they're generally honest enough to say that that is not their goal. This was in fact Martin Luther King's goal. What you're describing, Martin Luther King a whole generation ago uh, used the phrase, the beloved community. And Martin Luther King's idea was really very simple. And that is that the line between good and evil does not run between the races. It kind of runs through every human heart. Uh, and so there are good people in all groups and also justice and, and, and racism is something that, need, that can be outlawed by outlawing it on the individual level. And by that, I mean, we have an individual right to be judged, as, as King himself said, on the content of our character. By the way, right. notice that King doesn't just say merit. He says the content of our character, which is a bigger idea than merit. But if you, if you present this idea right now to any critical race theory guy, they'll start laughing sarcastically. They will say things like, well, that's the only line from Martin Luther King that you know and you seem to keep quoting. So what they do, they want to get away from that. The idea of colorblindness, of treating people as individuals, this is not what they are all about. Basically, what they're all about is, is italicizing or emphasizing race for every minority group except for whites. 
So they want every ethnic group to feel excited and proud of their heritage and to make demands based upon it. But they want whites to be disgusted, shamed and humiliated over their own heritage. And they want whites. It's not even that you can say, well, okay, you know what? I understand a lot of bad things were done by white people and I'm going to repudiate those things. Uh, and therefore, can I gain some sort of immunity because I'm, I don't want to be part of all that? And the answer is no, you can't. You can't gain any immunity. Why? Because you're white. And so even though you may not intend to be a racist, you are nevertheless a beneficiary of what? And we've all heard this phrase these days, white privilege. And so essentially what you have here is a kind of never ending wedge between the races and far from getting away from race, which I think was always the, the goal uh, of liberals. Wow, it's so interesting. And now, I am a father of six. My wife and I, uh, obviously, you, you look at us, we're white. And of our six kids, I have two children who are white. One is brown, three are black. And so it, it baffles me. Uh, am I supposed to look at my family as a mixture of uh, people uh, and children and, and treat some of them as inherently racist and others of my children as part of a permanently oppressed class? I mean, is that really what I ought to be teaching my own children? According to critical race theory, yes. Uh, and their reasoning wow. kind of goes like this. Their reasoning is that your black children are going to be black uh, in a society defined by white privilege. So no matter what you teach them, in fact, no matter what kind of benefits you give them, uh, it doesn't even matter if they're multimillionaires, the argument goes, they could still be pulled over by a cop because they're black. Uh, driving while black uh, is one of the kind of favored phrases of the CRT or critical race theory movement. So their argument is that you cannot get away from these things and no amount of kind of wholesomeness, no amount of your black kids and brown kids and white kids growing up together can heal these wounds. In some ways, it's a very despairing philosophy but at the same time, it's also a racket. And what I mean by that is that these advocates of critical race theory are all, they all view race as a business. In a weird way, if you say to them, you know, uh, would you be happy if racism were to sort of disappear overnight? We'd never have another ounce of racism. They'd be terrified because it's kind of like telling a car salesman, would you be happy if people stopped driving cars? That's, that, that's a whole paradigm shifter. Uh, you know, and I think that, I know that, you know, in, in the circles of people that I talk to and as I look around and, and travel the nation, nobody wants to be called a racist. Everyone's so afraid that they're going to be viewed as some sort of a bigot that they just, they just want to backpedal and, and virtue signal and make sure that no one sees them that way. Um, are you saying that maybe we don't actually need an emergency solution to deep systemic racial problems, but we're actually witnessing a very clever tool that is straight out of uh, a Marxist playbook that's designed to divide and weaken us? I mean, that sounds sinister. And, and if that's true, why in the world would anyone want to divide us as a nation? The whole point is we want to be united. Well, uh, that, isn't, that is exactly what I'm saying. And I think I can prove the point pretty decisively. So you just correctly described, I would say 99% of white people when you said nobody wants to be considered a racist. Now, think about this for a minute. Uh, what you're really saying is that deep down, inwardly, every white person pretty much rejects the code of racism. Uh, and therefore, if you accuse them of being a racist, they become very angry and defensive, not only because they don't want to be seen as a racist by society, but they don't want to see themselves as a racist. In other words, they have an inner moral code that rejects racism. Now, quite honestly, Kirk, if somebody were truly a racist, they would be very proud if you accuse them of being that. That's it's right, kind of I, like and I've heard them say come so. And accuse me of being, imagine if you accuse me of being, of being Indian. You won't get angry denials from me. I'd be like, sure, <laughs> yeah, I'm Indian, you're right. That's I'll right. take that as a compliment. So real racists are not ashamed of being racist. It's only people who are not racist who can be played with the accusation of racism because only non-racists respond by going, ah, you know, you're, this is like Dracula before the cross. They don't want the accusation of racism because they really aren't racist. That is such a great point. Man, I, I, I want to re rewind this and go back and, and listen to this. Uh, I, I can't wait to do that with my wife and my kids. You know, I think that with all of these 
all of these phrases that are becoming household uh, talking points in our homes and all these acronyms that we're hearing, I, I wonder why we as members of the family of faith who have a set of values that have produced the greatest civilizations in the world, who understand that there is a God that has made us and loves us and has a plan to set us free from the shackles of sin and guilt and, and, and abuse people uh, th because of our own selfishness, why are we always on the defense? Why, why are we always the ones to say, oh my goodness, CRT, what is that? Uh, here's a new acronym, now we have BLM, or it's, it's, it's some series of letters that is some phrase that we're afraid of and we're trying to figure out what to do about it. I say we come up with some of our own acronyms. Why don't we have something like CFT? How about critical faith theory that all the news stations are talking about? I think uh, George Washington might be the head of that organization. I think it was him that said, it's impossible to rightly govern the nation without God and the Bible. I mean, this is just basic history. This is stuff that, that, that anyone has known, even people who were a little more irreligious. You take uh, Benjamin Franklin and he understood that without Christianity, without true faith, that is critical, he said, in order for us to be free, uh, whether we're a believer or not a believer in a country like this. Why don't we get on the offense with that kind of thing? I think the, the real problem is that, uh, is that Christians are a little intimidated to live in secular culture. Let's remember that this is a little, this is a new experience for Christians in America because American society and Western society generally uh, used to be Christian society. Uh, and you could go, let's just say in America 1950, if you were to say to people, and it didn't matter if they were Christian or Jewish or maybe not even believers at all. If you were to say, hey, listen, what if every American were to uh, follow the 10 commandments? Do you think America would be a better or a worse place? And I think most Americans uh, of whatever background would go, I think it would be a lot better. So that's the definition of living in a society that is built on a Judeo-Christian foundation. Now, in the last sort of 50 years or so, we have been moving increasingly into secular culture. Uh, and in secular culture, you've got these kind of, I would call them secular prophets. These are secular radical leftists, and they come screeching into the public square, and they say things like, how can you be a real Christian and, and, and endorse racism? How can you be a real Christian and not accept that our society is fundamentally, systemically, institutionally racist? And see, the typical pastor, the typical youth pastor, the typical Christian in the pew is a little intimidated and they go, oh, well, wait a minute. Yeah, you know, how can I be a real Christian? You know, I need to, I need to basically, so, and then right away the surrender process begins and the surrender process is the one in which the Christian now allows secular values to dictate um, the way in which Christianity is understood. So far from taking Christianity to the world, think of it, we're supposed to be uh, the, the church's missionaries to the world. Some of these Christians have become the world's missionaries to the church. And so they say, oh yeah, let me take critical race theory and bring it into my church. So they're actually trying to take secular values, very often secular values, antithetical, at least in key respects to Christianity, and use those to transform the church and not the world. If we were to open up the playbook uh, that, that, that God gives us on how to uh, move the ball uh, the other direction on the field and begin to start moving toward uh, winning the cultural game, what are, what are just maybe one or two important plays that we need to, to, to put into action right now? If we could come up um, with a, um, an online university. Now, online universities today, by and large, uh, are uh, low cost, but they're also low quality. But can you imagine if you were to assemble, let's say the 100 uh, leading scholars and the best teachers in the world, uh, and you pluck them from the think tanks, you pluck them from all over the world, uh, and you offer a world-class online education for like $3,000 a year. Um, very doable, very achievable. That kind of a university, by the way, would, could have an unlimited number of students. There's no reason it couldn't have 1 million students. And if you could offer it at $3,000 a year in one stroke, 
you would make all of academic higher education obsolete. You wouldn't have to fight about this university and that university and can we take Harvard back and what can we do about Texas A&M? You don't have to do any of that. It's kind of like inventing the academic iPhone because the moment you've done it, all rotary phones are obsolete. And so what I'm getting at is this is the way we have to think. Not, we have to think in terms of the supply side, creating new institutions of education, of entertainment, and of culture in which we just defeat the other side in the marketplace of ideas because our stuff is simply better. Absolutely love it. And, and Dinesh, uh, I think you might be called to, uh, to the world stage at this time uh, for a purpose just like that. And uh, I can't wait to hear more about that. Thanks so much for being with me. Uh, I've loved hearing what you've had to say and, and, and sharing it uh, in, in, such, in such an accessible, digestible way.